Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Again, this is someone who doesn't need an introduction, so I will do my best. I, um, I like to refer to Dr. Bradley as uh, Doctors Bradley. Uh, some of you may know he has a PhD in chemical engineering after having attended Princeton and Caltech and translated that into his uh, medical training at UCSF. Um, he, he became involved, as I mentioned earlier, in MRI in the late 70s, uh, became an explainer of physics to generations of radiologists and physicists, like myself. So, uh, w and one of, the, one, of the, one of the most important research areas for him and his career was in fact about opening people's eyes to CSF flow. So it's a particular honor to have him here today. So okay, let me, let's wa welcome Dr. Bradley. I don't know how many people know it, but Bill Bradley is the author of the number one test on magnetic resonance imaging, a thousand page fat book that he wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Raymond. Actually, it's 2,880 pages. <laughs> in three volumes, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, but who's counting? Um, thank you, Raymond, for the invitation. Always a pleasure to see you. We've had some very interesting times together. Uh, nice to come to New York, see all my uh, Fonar friends and a lot of other friends, so uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, hopefully, you guys will stay awake. I hate to be the first post-prandial uh, talk, but I'll try to keep it interesting. Um, so yes, I thought looking at the, uh, the overall program, um, I would, rather than, rather than talking on CSF physiology and its total role in neurologic disease, since I don't really understand a lot of it and I'm learning, I've filled up a whole uh, uh, you know, little notepad already this morning. It's been very interesting. But I thought I'd try to lump things uh, the way I see them um, and look at CSF flow um, in, uh, in various diseases. Uh, as some of you know, I've been working on uh, a normal pressure hydrocephalus for over 30 years. Uh, my first job uh, out of training was at uh, um, the Huntington Medical Research Institute's in Pasadena. And I was kind of halfway between the big hospital, Huntington Hospital and Caltech, where I did my undergrad. And um, the guy that recruited me down there was actually a neurosurgeon. And if there's any elderly neurosurgeons in the audience, you may know, yeah. <laughs> you may know, you may remember the name Hunter Sheldon. Hunter was the, uh, I think, the president of the AANS or head, head of the board or Anyway, he and his longtime partner, Bob Pudens, invented the first shunt for hydrocephalus. And as a result, even though we were only the third largest hospital in LA, we got pretty much all the hydrocephalus referrals, particularly for NPH, normal pressure hydrocephalus. Now, for those of you that may not uh, dwell on NPH, uh, let me just say that uh, um, Bob Spetzler, who's the head of the Barrow Neurologic Institute, again, well known to all the neurosurgeons here, uh, in Phoenix, uh, in the Barrow Quarterly, uh, said that up to 10% of all cases of dementia might be due to uh, NPH, which is significant because it's treatable. Uh, that's the highest number I've ever seen from a reasonably reputable source, which is why I'm quoting it. But still, it could have, a, uh, could, ha could have a major effect. NPH could have a major effect uh, uh, on our aging population, and I, of course, include myself in that category. Uh, but um, I have been looking at CSF flow phenomena using various tools for 30 years. I'll show you some images going back that far. Um, so I, I would say almost established applications using phase contrast uh, uh, MRI to measure CSF flow to not just diagnose NPH, which is really a clinical diagnosis. There's plenty of neurologists and neurosurgeons here. You guys make the diagnosis. 
radiologists such as myself just, uh, you know, we don't even confirm the diagnosis. What we try to add is whether they're going to respond to a shunt or not. So I'll spend most of my time talking about that. And then I have the next category is evolving applications. Uh, Dr. Alperin's, inter, you know, using MRI totally non-invasively to measure intracranial pressure I think is huge. Uh, I'm glad to see a, a second paper, a second group using that now, Noam. Uh, we've known each other for a while. Uh, it sounds like he's still interested in moving to San Diego, which is good. <laughs> uh, but we've been, we've been in contact for a long time, and I've been very interested in his work. Uh, posterior fossa decompression for Chiari 1s uh, is, I, again, it's kind of a, an evolving application. I get requests from neurosurgeons, you know, is there flow behind the tonsils? Well, there's never flow behind the tonsils in a Chiari 1. How does that help you guys? Uh, but what people are beginning to do now is axial phase contrast imaging of the cord at like three different levels, measure the velocity, plug that into either the Bernoulli, modified Bernoulli equation or the Navier-Stokes equation, which Noam mentioned earlier, and come up with a calculation for a pressure gradient. And the idea is if there's enough of a pressure gradient, you might be forming a syrinx or hydromyelia in the case of uh, a Chiari 1. Uh, very exciting work being done at a number of sites. Vic Houghton, who's well known to any of the neural radiologists in the room, uh, has done some work on this. Uh, by the way, before I forget, uh, I love this multi-specialty uh, kind of approach to a new problem like this, Raymond. And we're having a, um, the American Society of Neuroradiology is meeting in San Diego. I think it's May 20th to the 25th or something like that. Um, this year, at the end of the meeting, actually uh, when it was meeting here in New York last year, we had a meeting um, at the end, which is like a day or a day and a half devoted to hydrocephalus and CSF flow. Um, we have neurosurgeons, neuro neurologists, neuroradiologists, engineers, basic scientists interested in CSF formation and uptake. Uh, meeting in that. It's a very nice um, cross-disciplinary approach to a big problem, hydrocephalus and using CSF flow. So if anybody has an interest in that, uh, you'll find me probably near the candy bars uh, over the break. I'll tell you how to get there. So then finally, potentially new applications. Um, I'm very excited about what I've heard this morning about how measuring CSF flow uh, cranial cervical junction syndrome may lead to a lot of diseases that have been around for a long time and nobody knows what causes them. So I'm very excited about that. Um, looking at uh, mild traumatic brain injury or concussion, as most of us would think of it, at UCSD uh, we use MEG, magnetoencephalography. And if it's not something you're familiar with, uh, it's like EEG, and as you know, anytime you have an electrical signal that generates a magnetic field, which generates an electrical signal. Uh, the difference is that EEG is distorted when it goes through like seven different layers getting out of the head, so it's hard to localize more than like one hemisphere or the other, whereas with MEG, the magnetic field is not distorted at all, but it's very weak. So you need a magnetically shielded room, which is about a million dollars, and this uh, hair dryer from hell, which is about $3 million, but if you uh, are able to put that together, uh, it's really the only way I know right now of uh, definitively diagnosing a concussion. Uh, we can see contusions just fine with T2-weighted MR and flare, but concussion, that's mostly based on symptoms, and if you're a patient that's been in a motor vehicle accident, uh, you know, you can go online and figure out what the symptoms of a concussion are. So you, you, you might have a little conflict of interest uh, in the subjective impression. Uh, the top here is the MEG. Uh, this is areas of abnormal low frequency magnetic activity. Uh, and it happens to correlate exactly where this hockey player was elbowed and had a uh, uh, concussion. 
Now, typically, we, we are using diffusion tensor imaging for that. Uh, but I have to say it's a whole lot harder to read subtle losses of fractional anisotropy on a DTI uh, or to see a divot compared to these big red dots on MEG. So uh, as we talk, we, uh, where I'm thinking about putting one of your stand-up, you know, your upright magnets, I've stopped calling it erect. I'm getting better. Uh, I got slapped in the face for being a little inappropriate occasionally, but um, that's in San Diego, not in New York. So <laughs> anyway, uh, I think I want to put it near the MEG so we can do some of this, these trauma patients because we get a lot of them in San Diego with the Navy and the Marine base. Okay, so now I'm going to really focus my talk on something I know a little bit about, which is uh, using CSF flow uh, for evaluation of different types of hydrocephalus. MR by itself, without any CSF flow, is useful to show interstitial edema, that is transependental spread of CSF. Uh, which we don't see as well with CT. Uh, CSF flow, uh, as you'll see in a few minutes, uh, tells us whether the, uh, the patients that clinically present with NPH are shuntable. Okay. Uh, for those of you that don't deal with hydrocephalus, the classic teaching is that CSF is formed by the choroid plexus within the ventricles. It flows out the foramina of Majandi uh, and Lushka, some of it going down around the spinal cord, most of it going up over the convexities to be absorbed by the arachnoidal granulations and villi. Uh, obstruction anywhere from the point of production to the point of uptake leads to backup and hydrocephalus. Um, <laughs> you go back 100 years, um, it was broken down into uh, obstructive and communicating. I think that was Dandy that did that, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, obstructive is proximal to the outlet foramen of the fourth ventricle, usually due to a tumor, sometimes due to uh, inflammation at the aqueduct, for example, narrow parts. And then communicating is uh, distal to the outlet foramen of the, of the fourth ventricle, and that's usually due to subarachnoid hemorrhage or meningitis. Normal pressure hydrocephalus, or NPH, is a subset of chronic communicating hydrocephalus. And it's defined clinically as a triad of a gait disturbance, dementia, and incontinence. Okay? So it's a clinical syndrome. Uh, just again, uh, if you're not doing neuroradiology a lot, uh, this is enlarged ventricles, this is interstitial edema, the bright stuff on the flare, uh, transpendable spread of CSF. Uh, here is chronic obstruction due to this colloid cyst in the anterior third ventricle. Uh, enlarged ventricles, a little bit of bright signal. Now, this is not interstitial edema. This is uh, pendomyonis granularis, which was described uh, actually by the, uh, the chief of uh, neuroradiology at Yale, Gordon Zay, uh, when he was still uh, at UCSF, where I did my training back in the 80s. Um, that was when that was described. So this is a 40-year-old woman that has a gait disturbance and has been carrying a diagnosis of MS for 20 years. And uh, this is CSF in the frontal horns and the occipital horns. And you can see as we get close to the foramen of Monroe, it turns black. Uh, those of us that do a lot of MRI know that when you have rapidly flowing anything like blood or CSF, it turns black. We call it a flow void. <clears throat> Coming on down, uh, her third ventricle normally should have a waist. This one is bowed out, and it's very black, indicating hyperdynamic flow. Continues on down through the aqueduct, uh, through the fourth, uh, down all the way to the bottom of the fourth, or, or the obex. Um, this is a proton density, yes. Um, the way we radiologists keep you neurosurgeons in line is every 10 years we come up with a new sequence to keep you on your toes. I had a lot of fun with flare because, you know, the CSF's dark, but it's not a T1. It looks like a T2. And we're, we're getting ready to come up with something else, but unless you know the secret handshake. Uh, this is a T1. 
Um, and if you look really carefully, um, you'll see that this area is a little darker than this area. And that's because we have a turbulent jet of CSF going back and forth over the cardiac cycle. Um, and uh, that's what's creating this low signal. Now this is a 28-year-old um, woman presenting with um, papilledema, headaches, rule-out brain tumor. And whereas in the last case, we could see the aqueduct all the way through, in this case, we, we, we see the aqueduct is flared proximally, but we don't see it distally. And she has aqueductal stenosis. Now today, we diagnose aqueductal stenosis intrauterine or within the first week or two of life. But back in the mid-70s, there was a series from the Mayo Clinic of, uh, I think it was about 25 patients. They were all in their late 20s, early 30s, about two to one female predominance um, diagnosed with aqueductal stenosis. And as I'll show later, we are now diagnosing aqueductal stenosis uh, in elderly patients that come in with rule out NPH, and what I didn't realize that I'm sure the neurosurgeons in the room know, is that aqueductal stenosis, if you live long enough, presents with the same symptoms as NPH plus headaches, same clinical triad plus headaches. So we are seeing those patients now. Now again, aqueductal stenosis, there's no flow coming down here, and normally we should always see a little black hole there where the uh, aqueduct is from this pulsatile flow. If you don't see it, uh, something's blocked. So, okay, switching gears. This is a seven-month-old baby. Uh, his head circumference is going up proportionately higher than his body length or body weight. Uh, and the pediatrician has sent him in for rule-out brain tumor. We do this image, and this is what we in radiology call an ant mini. Once you've seen one or two of these, you recognize it uh, like you would your ant mini. This is a disease called benign external hydrocephalus. Uh, in the six to 12 month age range, the sutures are still open. So if there's any decrease in the absorption of CSF, it can accumulate over the convexities or in slightly enlarged ventricles, and the head can expand. Um, we are taught uh, not, not to read these as if they need a shunt, uh, that they will self-correct because it's due to immature arachnoidal granulations. That's the classic teaching. I don't necessarily believe that. Um, we don't examine these patients you know, when they're three or four or five, doing an invasive saline infusion study to see if their uptake of uh, CSF or saline is decreased. We do that when they get to be 70 or 80 with NPH. So kind of hold that thought because we'll be coming back to this supposedly benign disease or condition. Um, before going to UCSD, I was at Long Beach Memorial, um, which is the second largest hospital in LA behind Cedars. And uh, uh, we had 200 pediatric beds. We had 1,000 beds total, 200 pediatric. So we'd see this like once a month. Um, again, enlargement of the frontal subarachnoid space, mild ventricular enlargement. You know this is the subarachnoid space, not, not a, like a benign uh, subdural effusion because the vessels would be plastered against the brain if this were a subdural. And it's floating free in the subarachnoid space. Switching gears again, uh, this is a child that's had a long-standing tectal glioma. Obviously, the CSF cannot get through the aqueduct to go out. So one might ask, how does it get out? And uh, it gets out through the extracellular space of the brain um, and maybe punches through the pia to get the to the subarachnoid space. It may go through aquaporin-4. Uh, there's been talk about the Virchow-Roban spaces, the perivascular spaces. They are lined with aquaporin-4, so there may be uh, some role for these aquaporins uh, in the, both the uptake and the formation 
of CSF. Um, this is the same child following uh, shunting. The neurosurgeons might say over shunting because we have slit-like ventricles. Um, and we also have a new CSF space here. This is called the colossal sulcus. Um, it's due, it, it, it is seen in, in typically kids that have been chronically obstructed and then shunted, and it's a potential space in most uh, patients. Uh, it'll last for about a year until the brain remodels. Here's another case. We'd see this at least once a year. Again, not as common. The notching on the upper surface of the corpus callosum is where the pericolossal artery penetrates the corpus callosum. Another case, again, not uncommon, tectoglioma. Okay, so this is a uh, patient we followed for many years when I was at Huntington in Pasadena. Uh, it was a thalamic glioma that grew up to obstruct, obstruct the uh, foramen of Monroe, uh, limiting the outflow of CSF. So CSF begins to build up inside the ventricles. The pressure increases. Some CSFs forced across the ependema um, as interstitial edema. Uh, and, and slowly the ventricles enlarge. As they enlarge, the pressure gradient decreases, and then there is less interstitial edema. This image, by the way, is about 30 years old. And um, this is a different case, but this is a, a pretty classic case of normal pressure hydrocephalus, where we see no interstitial edema, and clearly enlargement of the ventricles. Now, the primary finding clinically in NPH is the gait disturbance. And even though the, the mean pressure is normal here, the pulse pressure is anything but normal. It's like six to eight times uh, higher than normal, sometimes called a water hammer pulse. And the hammering of this water hammer pulse against the paracentral fibers of the cortical spinal tracts that go to the legs may contribute to the gait disturbance. It's more complicated than that, but that's part of it. So NPH was first described by Solom Solomon Hakim uh, when he was up at Mass General doing his residency. Um, paper came out in 1965 in the New, New England Journal. Uh, initially, it was due to just idiopathic forms of, uh, hydros of, of uh, uh, NPH. Uh, over the last 40 years or so, uh, known causes of chronic communicating hydrocephalus have been added. Uh, these patients tend to be younger, and they tend to do better with the shunt. The idiopathic form, uh, which is the one I'm interested in, tends to be older and historically has not done as well with the shunt, maybe because of the selection criteria. And I'll show you a few of those. As I mentioned, the uh, diagnosis is based on clinical grounds, a gait disturbance, um, sometimes called a gait apraxia. They kind of forget how to walk. It's a wide-based, low-clearance gait, sometimes called a magnetic gait, which works for me. Uh, dementia and then incontinence. Now, if the biggest problem isn't the gait problem and they get shunted, they're unlikely to improve their dementia. And in fact, in the late 60s, a lot of patients were shunted primarily for dementia, and they didn't get better, and the whole question of NPH was called into question, and the whole existence was called into question. Uh, you don't need the full triad to shunt the patients. Again, I'm carrying coals to Newcastle with the uh, neurosurgeons here. Um, uh, if you wait until they are incontinent, uh, their chance of responding to a shunt is less. Over the years, radiology has shown ventricles enlarged out of proportion to the cortical sulci. In other words, communicating hydrocephalus. Um, there are a number of additional tests, physiologic tests for NPH. Nuclear cisternography shows ventricular reflux with slow uptake uh, of the um, uh, indium uh, DTPA over the convexities. This tells us that we have disordered CSF uh, resorption, but it doesn't tell us if they're going to respond to a shunt which is what the neurosurgeons generally want to know. Pressure monitoring is typically done by neurosurgeons or sometimes neurologists. 
looking for that water hammer pulse or plateau or B waves. Saline infusion can be done on an outpatient basis. Um, and uh, probably the most common test done in the United States, certainly in our place, is the high volume tap test where 35 to 50 cc's of CSF is taken out. And as you can see, it's very uh, specific, um, has a good positive predictive value, but uh, the sensitivity is, uh, is a little bit low. Uh, so if they do respond to a TAP test, you can go ahead and shunt them. If they don't, then you need another uh, test. Now, Tony Marmaru's name was uh, mentioned earlier uh, by Noam. Uh, this is, um, he, he was a champion of external lumbar drainage, did a lot of work on this. This is far from the saline infusion. This is an inpatient exam, takes three days. Uh, a 16 gauge lumbar puncture. Geez, I haven't done that uh, since the Panopec days. Actually, that was an 18 even. Anyway, they put in a catheter and Nurse Ratchet comes by every hour <laughs> and takes off 10 cc's of CSF. And if you make it for three days without the worst headache of your life, uh, your gait is reassessed. Um, again, from, yeah, exactly. Hey, as long as they have insurance, right? I'm not in California. <laughs> anyway. Uh, this is from Tony Marmaru, who died about uh, two years ago, I think. Uh, great guy. Um, so he looked at 151 patients with idiopathic NPH, and of the 100 that improved with this external lumbar drainage, uh, most of them only had gait or gait and dementia. Um, a smaller fraction had the full triad. Um, of the responders to ELD, 90% improved with the VP shunt, which frankly might be considered less invasive, at least up front during the procedure than the external lumbar drainage. And fully a fifth of the patients uh, uh, responded to a shunt if they didn't respond to ELD. Um, now, again, why, why isn't everybody shunted if they have symptoms that might be NPH? Because shunts can be bad. Shunts on average need to be corrected once a year. You get subdurals, the pressure has to be adjusted, uh, infections, there's all sorts of reasons not to shunt patients. So surgeons need to be very careful in this area and hopefully MRI is a non-invasive technique that'll help. Um, here is fairly typical, um, enlarged vents, big flow void through the third, a lot of deep white matter ischemia, Flow void going down to the bottom of the fourth to the obex. Another example, they all kind of look the same, you know, Aunt Minnie. Uh, upward bowing of the corpus callosum, flattening of the gyri against the inner table of the calvarium, as opposed to atrophy, where the gyri are more peg like. Uh, the gait disturbance, as I mentioned, is. Um, is complicated. It's not just the paracentral fibers of the cortical spinal tract where the fibers to the legs go. Um, we sometimes see the anterior third herniating down into the inner peduncular cistern where it may pound on the uh, pars compacta of the substantia nigra. You could get a mechanical Parkinson's from this and there's a Parkinsonian component or element to this if you will. Here is uh, anterior third, you know, clearly with the water hammer pulse, it's likely to be hitting the pars compacta, which is right where I'm pointing. Um, so our early interest in um, CSF flow was basically just looking at the flow void on a, uh, on a, a proton density weighted uh, spin echo image. Uh, here we see uh, the flow void at the foramen of uh, uh, Monroe, and it extends down through the third, down through the aqueduct, down to the bottom of the fourth ventricle. That would be a four plus flow void. What causes the CSF motion? It's not just production of CSF by the choroid plexus, which at 500 cc's a day would hardly give you the linear displacement through the aqueduct that would lead to that kind of a flow void. 
Rather, what we're seeing is superimposed cardiac pulsations. Uh, Baring, whose name has already been mentioned, was a neurosurgeon at Harvard in the mid and late 50s, thought it was systolic expansion of the choroid plexus. George Dubelay at Queen Square thought it was uh, transmitted pulsations from the circle of Willis. But we now know from Van Wadeen's work at Mass General on brain motion, phase contrast brain motion studies, that it's systolic expansion of the cerebral hemispheres squeezing on the ventricles, causing CSF to go down during systole and then kind of rebound up during diastole. So our first um, study on NPH looked at 20 patients that were shunted for clinical NPH in 1984. We put in our magnet actually in May of 83. Uh, it was the first clinical magnet west of the Mississippi. Um, all of these patients had uh, gait disturbance and dementia. Uh, and most of them were actually late in their disease. They had incontinence. We evaluated the surgical response in 1984. One of our fellows went and looked at the charts, ranked it excellent, good, fair, or poor. At that point in 1984, we weren't aware of the CSF flow void. Five years later, uh, we were. And one of our other fellows went back and graded the flow void uh, without looking back at the clinical chart. So we had a double blind comparison of flow void versus surgical response. Now remember, this is CSF flow void on a routine MRI, which is a, again, proton density, weighted spin echo, no flow compensation, low res compared to normal studies today. But we still saw that flow void in the aqueduct, and it did not go down uh, to the uh, mid-fourth or the lower-fourth, as opposed to hyperdynamic flow. And even with this very early technique, we can see the flow void going down to the obex. And what we found was that uh, patients with a marked flow void had a good surgical response to shunting for NPH, whereas those with a minimal flow, minimal flow void did not. This was significant at the 0.003 level, which is good for any, um, you know, any imaging test. So back in 1984, if the patients were appropriately uh, clinically symptomatic and we had a big flow void like this, uh, surgeon had a a reasonable chance of having a good result from shunting these patients. What do we think is going on? Um, this is uh, the normal brain. There's space sort of within the brain occupied by the uh, ventricles, and there's space over the convexities occupied by cortical veins and CSF. When the brain expands during systole, it expands outwards, compressing those cortical veins, leading to subsequent venous outflow. And it expands inwards, compressing the ventricles, leading to CSF outflow, which we see as a normal CSF flow void. In early communicating hydrocephalus, during diastole, uh, the brain is still expanded up against the inner table of the calvarium. The ventricles are enlarged. Uh, during systole, when blood comes in, it can't expand the brain out, it's all expanded in against a bigger drum surface. That is the surface area of the lateral ventricles. So you end up with hyperdynamic CSF flow through the aqueduct. Now over time, these patients will develop atrophy, initially central atrophy and then later generalized atrophy. With atrophy, there's less blood coming into the brain and the power behind the CSF pump kind of goes away and their flow void will decrease. <coughs> Um, there are other signs of NPH. Uh, we're in New York, so I should mention Ajax George's work from NYU, who showed back in the 80s that the sylvian cisterns would be enlarged in NPH. Uh, we think of this as an extra axial place for CSF to accumulate, although there are probably a lot of people that would think large sylvian cisterns is a sign of atrophy. So it's important to know this. The Japanese have uh, really kind of taken this finding, uh, and they've come up with a, uh, an acronym called DESH, uh, Disproportionately Enlarged Subarachnoid Space Hydrocephalus. And they're looking at large basal cisterns and a tight convexity. Another uh, example of large sylvian cisterns in patients with NPH, uh, 
There may be some, um, some atrophy. Some of these may represent uh, atrophic uh, gyri and large sulci, although uh, this sulcus is a little ballooned out. Uh, Joe Mazdu at, uh, at the NIH and I were chatting about this at the American Academy of Neurology a couple of years ago, and we think this may be another place for extra axial CSF to accumulate. And this is uh, DESH. Um, again, large subarachnoid spaces, basal or subarachnoid spaces, and a very tight superior convexity. Uh, interestingly, uh, there was a paper from Japan just a couple of years ago saying that if you had this DESH pattern just off a coronal MRI, the TAP test didn't add anything. Whew. That would, uh, that would be a major uh, game changer for us. So we've been collecting DESH images, or we've been collecting coronal MRs on everybody uh, since that paper came out. I mentioned deep white matter ischemia. That's been associated with NPH for quite a while even going back to 1974, pre-CT era. We thought deep white matter ischemia might be a contraindication uh, to shunting for NPH. Uh, so we looked at it, and we fact found that uh, there was a greater incidence of deep white matter ischemia in NPH patients than in age match controls at a highly significant level. Going back to that 1974 paper, they actually say in the abstract, multiple deep cerebral infarctions may be the initial pathologic process in some cases of NPH. As you'll see in a minute, uh, I think it is part of the cause of NPH, but it may be the second hit rather than the first hit. And having deep white matter ischemia, uh, even marked deep white matter ischemia does not impact the surgical response. And in fact, there is a higher incidence of deep white matter ischemia in NPH than in age match controls, and that may be part of the disease. Um, so we put a lot of faith in this uh, CSF flow void, which uh, represents some kind of averaging of motion over whatever, 192 or 256 acquisitions, depending on how many phase encodes. Uh, if we really want to get a handle on this, though, we ought to look at cardiac gated techniques. So back in the early 90s, uh, we started using phase contrast um, for CSF velocity imaging. Uh, for the radiologists in the room, this is uh, same software as phase contrast MR angiography. Uh, we just changed the technique a bit. Um, this is a velocity technique, it's a vector, so we get not only the speed but the direction of flow. And we flow sensitize in this application along the cranial caudal axis. You've seen images already, flow up is black, flow down is white, or you can set that. No flow is always gray. You need to set the aliasing uh, velocity, uh, and this allows you to quantify uh, velocity or volumetric flow. This was our uh, earliest technique in 1990. We could put a cursor over the aqueduct here and get some kind of a curve showing flow uh, through the aqueduct. Now the problem was this is a four millimeter thick slice, so we're partial voluming stationary midbrain on either side of the aqueduct, so it wasn't quantitative. So we called it the qualitative technique, but then the next year we came out with this quantitative technique, which is a high resolution technique yielding pixels of 320 microns. Um, we velocity encode in the slice direction. We use something called retrospective cardiac gating as opposed to EKG triggering. We keep track of the R wave and then retrospectively bin the data into whatever, 18 cine frames. Uh, we lined it up perpendicular. This is the acquisition plane. It's perpendicular to the aqueduct. Uh, so we're looking down the bore of the aqueduct without partial volume averaging. And we do different vents. Uh, we also use this technique, by the way, to evaluate for shunt malfunction. But uh, I think about 15 years ago, uh, Raymond and I were uh, at the RSNA booth at one of your exhibits and uh, uh, talking about how much more efficacious it would be if the patient were erect, uh, I'm sorry, upright, 
Um, you know, to see if there's flow. I mean, if there's no flow where they're lying down, there's not much of a gravity change, right? So it'd be a lot better to do them if they're upright. Um, so that's something we uh, will want to look at in the future. Here are the phase contrast uh, printouts. Uh, see if this cine will run. Okay, so near the tip of uh, the finger, that's, uh, that's black, so it's flow going up during diastole. And you'll see uh, in the aqueduct, and you'll see it turn bright as flow comes down during systole. Uh, Gnome showed some uh, nice uh, <coughs> movies, so I've got to show a movie. Uh, this is uh, using... Uh, uh, software called Nova from a company called Valsol um, from Chicago, where Gnome was originally from, or at least was when I first met him. Um, and you can see the parabolic flow profiles, the CSF pulsates through the aqueduct. What's interesting is that bi-directional flow, which we've seen several times now. Uh, but basically, we integrate over the area of the aqueduct to get volumetric flow. Uh, flow up, flow down, and typically it's about the same, up and down. Uh, there's maybe uh, 20 steps forward, 19 steps back. So you have like a net 5% forward motion, which accounts for that 500 cc's a day. But uh, most of it is pulsatile. Uh, we've done this on GE and Siemens. Uh, we'd like to do it on Phonar. Um, again, all we need is that retrospective cardiac gating technique. Here is some homegrown printout showing velocity. Here's volumetric flow um, versus uh, time. Obviously, if you integrate uh, mLs per second over time, you get mL. So this is the volume going down during systole. And if you integrate under these two half curves, you get the volume going up during diastole, and those two volumes should be very close to each other. We take the average of those two and call that the aqueductal CSF stroke volume. And we verified this with <coughs> flow phantoms and all that. So our second study involved 20 patients with suspected NPH. They all had routine MRs. They had the quantitative technique. They had follow-up at one month after shunting. Uh, 14 of those patients had hyperdynamic flow. Now, this was kind of as, <coughs> as we were evolving. This, we'd been doing this technique for about 15 years at this point. We had a group of neur neurosurgeons, neurologists, and neuroradiologists that met monthly when I was at Long Beach Memorial. There were about 20 or 30 people every month. And uh, um, I showed a case, and one of the neurologists got up and said, you know, it is malpractice to shunt a patient for NPH without a CSF flow study. So I slipped him a little money afterwards. And uh, uh, now, nah, unfortunately, he moved to Houston. But uh, <laughs> great having a testimonial like that. So, you know, over time, these things become accepted. I can't say this is accepted everywhere, but uh, we were doing 110 cases a year for 10 years when I was at Long Beach. And we're doing probably 50 now when I'm, you know, at uh, UCSD. So one a week or so. Uh, and we're getting paid for them. Uh, so of the 20 patients, 14 had hyperdynamic flow, which on this particular machine was greater than 42 microliters. And I should emphasize that it is machine specific. 13 of those had a good surgical response. One did not. 73-year-old physician with chronic MS. Um, when we submitted the paper to radiology, uh, they made us take this patient out because of a comorbidity, which gave us 13 out of 13, 100% positive predictive value. Yay. Uh, we did not argue. Uh, six patients had normal or decreased flow. Um, half of them had a good surgical response. Half did not. Uh, so there's always a little bit of, con I always thought it was a little bit of concomitant atrophy, but then there was a paper, um, Antonio Scalato from, from uh, Florence, Italy, 
came out in February about four years ago in AJNR, and uh, he's a neurosurgeon that does these phase contrast measurements, has a large following of NPH patients. Uh, some patients had symptomatic NPH, but they didn't have a big flow void or big stroke volume. Um, so he wouldn't shunt them, but he'd bring them back in six months. Six months later, they have a big stroke volume. So I've always thought we were too late, and they already had atrophy, but we may be too early. Again, not everything's going to show up morphologically. As we're beginning to hear, I think, today, there's a lot of functional changes that we may not see, not just with NPH, but with all these diseases. Now, here's a patient with clinical NPH that doesn't have a big flow void in the third, uh, yet his stroke volume was, uh, let's see, normal on this machine was 42. That's three times normal. Uh, so phase contrast is decidedly more sensitive than the flow void that we started with. And in fact, in that second series, only half the patients had hyperdynamic flow on the routine images. And that's because at that point we were using flow compensation for every patient. Now with fast spin echo, it's even less apparent. So we don't use the flow void, but if it's there, it's fairly specific. It's just not sensitive. We use phase contrast for sensitivity. Um, this is uh, from Joe Mazdu, um, patient uh, with NPH before the, the shunt. And uh, again, if you haven't seen this, uh, wide-based gait, low clearance, not getting along real well. Turn around. Do I have to? Okay, not great mobility here. Okay, so that's uh, pre-shunt. This, this is her vents prior to shunting, after shunting. And now look at the same lady. Oh, you want me to walk? Sure. Look at the difference. Now hubby's off to the side. I can do this on my own, thank you very much. So uh, big, big change. 78-year-old uh, lady, come in, rule out NPH, big vents, looks good. Anterior third coming down into the cella. Huh. At this point, we're automatically getting phase contrast studies with every rule out NPH case. They just order them together. But there's nothing, nothing on the phase contrast, nothing at all. So we bring her back and we do a, um, this is an SSFP, steady state free procession technique. Um, there's probably only two or three people that know this technique. This is from Siemens, but it's one millimeter thick. And we can't quite clear the aqueduct. There's this little membrane here. She has aqueductal stenosis, presenting with rule out NPH because she's got the clinical triad. But she also has a history of chronic headaches which a lot of people have, so it's hard to pick up. So now, when anybody comes in for rule out NPH, not only do we do the routine MR, phase contrast, but we get the sagittal cysts or Fiesta, if you have a GE scanner, TrueFISP, if you have a new uh, Siemens. Here's what it looks like on a cyst when it's open. Here is a Fiesta, basically the same technique, uh, showing a membrane. So let me finish up with um, what do I think causes idiopathic NPH. Um, and to consider, we need to consider the bulk flow of water in the brain and the association of deep white matter ischemia and NPH. We know water leaves the upstream arterioles under pressure and osmotic gradients, which is why mannitol works for acute brain edema. Normal and excess water is resorbed by the downstream capillaries and venules. Vasogenic edema from blood-brain barrier breakdown moves centrally to be absorbed by the ventricles. And interstitial edema from obstructive 
uh, hydrocephalus goes peripherally, um, somehow getting to the subarachnoid space, most likely through the extracellular space of the brain. We know that NPH and deep white matter ischemia are both diseases of the elderly. Uh, significant association has been shown by many now. We know the cerebral blood flow is reduced in both. We know with the Diamox challenge test, there's no increase in CBF. The arterioles are already maximally dilated, particularly in the white matter. Uh, deep white matter ischemia is more extensive than what we see on a T2 or a flare. We know this from other uh, techniques. So again, having looked at this disease for 30 years, you start thinking what might cause it. And the thought is that maybe these patients have always had large ventricles. As radiologists or any of you that might order, you know, CTs or MRs of the brain, how often do you get back a report that says, you know, ventricles at the upper limits of normal, ventricles mildly dilated, uncertain clinical significance, clinical correlation, whatever. Uh, I've done it. Uh, so the question is, could these kids, could these elderly patients have had benign external hydrocephalus as kids? Maybe their arachnoid granulations never matured, and they always had decreased absorption. Um, we show that with a saline infusion test now, but we certainly don't do that on babies. These, these patients don't have evidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage or meningitis. Um, we think that they may have a significant kind of a parallel CSF resorption pathway via the extracellular space of the brain, like those kids with technical gliomas had. And everything is fine until the second hit of deep white matter ischemia. So imagine CSF going out through the extracellular space, kind of gliding over the lipid in the myelin. Then with deep white matter ischemia, you get myelin pallor, you have less lipid. All of a sudden now, the water, the CSF, is attracted to the myelin protein. With attraction, there's increased resistance to outflow. CSF backs up, the ventricles begin to enlarge, you get the tangential shearing forces leading to the gait disturbance, and then the radial uh, forces leading to the dementia. This is Hakim's work. So, um, People that study this use these electrical analog circuits. This is resistance to the flow through the normal CSF pathways. And here it is through the extracellular space of the brain. For those of you that aren't into electrical analog circuits, uh, right after lunch, if you have a big straw and you apply a certain amount of suction, you get lots of Diet Coke. But if you get a little straw, you don't get so much for the same amount of suction. But if you have a parallel pathway, you get twice as much Diet Coke, or you get rid of twice as much CSF with the same pressure drop. Uh, we had a, a medical student um, who was a double, double E from Yale who helped me with all this um, and showed that as the resistance to the normal pathway increased, flow through the extracellular space decreased. Uh, I'm sorry, increased through the e extra pathway. Uh, he was a very good double E, but uh, obviously no Latin scholar, or he would have known that fex is the singular of feces. <laughs> no shit. Uh, obviously, their heads do not continue to enlarge forever. They plateau, so that makes sense. So if this is obviously a hypothesis, but if they're, if, if, 70-year-old NPH patients had benign external hydrocephalus before a year of age, their intracranial volume should be larger than sex and age match controls. And if they rely on drainage of CSF through the extracellular space of the brain, the apparent diffusion coefficient, which is a measure of water content, should be larger for a given degree of deep white matter ischemia, which already increases the uh, water content. So we looked at uh, 22 patients with clinical NPH, 22 men, 29 women, versus uh, age and sex match controls. Uh, notice the stroke volumes in these NPHs is four times normal, 
three times normal, so they were clinically NPH and stroke volume was up, hyperdynamic flow. And we measured their intracranial volumes and in fact found that in men, uh, only 100 cc's or so, but uh, given the number of patients, this was significant at the 0.003 level. For women, volume's a little less than 100, but uh, again, significant at the 0.002 level. So their heads are larger, which just adds a little you know, evidence that maybe this started out when they were babies. Uh, so if we see patients with slightly enlarged ventricles for no apparent reason, uh, I usually call up the neurologist that ordered the study and say, is there a gait disturbance that wasn't on the history? And if he says no, then I'll say, well, um, watch for a gait disturbance. It's not going to be in the report because I don't want to mess up their health insurance, but uh, they could end up getting NPH. Uh, ADC measurements, let me just kind of at the end of my time, so let me uh, just show you. This is... Um, Think of this as a plot of water content. This is the ventricles, the lateral ventricles, and you can see that the water in the extracellular space is kind of pooling next to the ventricles. It's like the deep white matter ischemia is damming up the outflow of CSF, causing it to accumulate here. And when we look at um, uh, ADC at a given level of deep white matter ischemia, at each level, we see st significantly higher ADCs, indicating more water in the extracellular space of the brain than in uh, control patients. And by the way, we found a few patients of our controls that had big vents, but not symptomatic NPH. And we begin to think of them as pre-NPH. Again, uh, the Japanese are all over this. They have a, an acronym for this called asymptomatic ventriculomegaly with features of idiopathic NPH on MRI. <laughs> Let me, uh, again, I'm getting near the end of my time. Uh, I've actually, I've gone over. Thank you, Jay. Um, this, pay attention to this. If you're snoozing after that nice lunch, uh, this is the father of one of my co-residents from San Francisco. Uh, he calls me up one day and says his dad's been diagnosed with NPH. Uh, is this neurosurgeon any good? I say, yeah, yeah, he's fine. Uh, and oh, by the way, if he has NPH now, do you have previous CTs or MRs? He says, yeah. Well, you send them to me. So this is, uh, this is from 19 years before, and his father is walking 20 miles a day. You can already tell his vents are enlarged. He's now 70, massively enlarged vents, no symptoms. He's now 76. Uh, he won't develop symptomatic NPH for another 10 years, but the vents are huge. He's got deep point matter ischemia. He's got a big flow void in the aqueduct. So you don't treat the MRI. You treat the symptoms. 10 years later, unfortunately, he has a pacemaker, so I can't get an MRI before he gets shunted. And uh, he was shunted, and he did well. This is the sort of... Uh, history we like to see, or phone message we like to see. Um, by the way, this is pi pasted from a, an 86-year-old physician that had a, an equivocal external lumbar drainage, <coughs> which hurt, and he heard about our CSF flow study, which did not hurt, so he, um, he we came down, he had a very positive CSF flow study. Um, I, you can tell I copied this. I know how to spell optimistic. <laughs> he's an internist. Oh, any internists out there? Yeah. He's 86. I should have said he's 86. Anyway, he was shunted. He did, he did substantial improvement. So. so anyway, to the radiologists, uh, if you see big vents like this that shouldn't be there, uh, again, I just call the neurologist to say be on the lookout for a gait problem. So let me summarize. Uh, NPH is diagnosed by symptoms, not by MRI, not by CT. Uh, this is a classic case where we need to all work together. MRI is used to confirm a diagnosis of shunt responsive NPH. Uh, we use this with a tap test, and if they're both positive or one is very positive, then they'll usually shunt the patients if they're symptomatic enough. 
Asymptomatic patients may have dilated ventricles <coughs> and elevated CSF flow. This could be pre-NPH. Not everybody with benign external hydrocephalus as babies probably gets NPH. The key is keeping your extracellular space open. So personally, I try to take this medicine every night to make sure my extracellular space is open. Thank you very much for your attention.